Another coaching change in Tampa as they promote John Van Dam and hire Justin Peel. That and more on today's episode of Locked on Bucks. You are Locked on Buccaneers, your daily Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome into this Thursday episode of Locked On Bucks, your daily podcast covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listener view every single day. Don't forget you can subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, you can follow along on Twitter. I am James Yarko at JRCO underscore Bucks, credentialed member of the media covering your Tampa Bay Buccaneers as deputy editor of SB Nation's BucksNation.com. Here with you every Monday through Friday, along with the everydayers. And for that, I want to share my appreciation for your continued support of the show. One of the ways you can support the show is become a Locked On Bucks insider. You're going to get news, rumors, updates, general thoughts, plus one-on-one -on -one conversations with me via text message. So go to jointsubtext.com slash Locked On Bucks to become an insider today. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started is Chris Godwin going to explode like Cooper cup did a few seasons back. And apparently the Atlanta Falcons are the team to beat in the NFC South. All of that is coming up in a little bit, but first let's start with a change in the coaching staff as now former tight ends coach, John Van Dam, who was an internal candidate for the Bucks offensive coordinator position has been promoted to passing game assistant and they have hired Justin Peel as their new tight ends coach. Van Dam has been with the Bucks now. This is going to be his sixth season and uh, he was a tight ends coach for the Bucks the last few years before that. He was an offensive quality control coach while Bruce Arians was the head coach of the team. However, Justin Peel is someone that the Bucks are already somewhat familiar with, having spent the last three years in Atlanta. So going back, Justin Peel spent 11 seasons in the NFL as a tight end, playing for the San Diego Chargers, the Miami Dolphins, Atlanta Falcons, San Francisco 49ers, and Pittsburgh Steelers. After his final year as a player in 2012, he immediately went into coaching with the Philadelphia Eagles. He was the assistant tight ends coach for the Eagles from 2013 to 2014. Then he was promoted to tight ends coach in 2015, where he held that job through the 2020 season and was part of that staff that won Super Bowl 52 in 2021. He joined the Atlanta Falcons in that same position as the tight ends coach, where he has been in each of the last three seasons. But do not judge him off of Kyle Pitts usage, because that certainly was not his fault. That's why Arthur Smith just got fired. But going back to his first season with Philadelphia, Peel has coached some extremely talented tight ends. He had Zach Ertz and Brent Selleck back when he was the assistant in 2013. They started working Trey Burton into the mix as his tenure with Philadelphia continued. Then he had Dallas Goddard, who joined in 2018. Every year, that Justin Peel was with the Eagles, the tight end group combined for over a thousand receiving yards. And in some cases, Zach Ertz hit that threshold on his own. So he switched over to the Falcons in 2021 and Kyle Pitts went over a thousand yards in his rookie season, which I think a lot of people forget because he only had, I believe it was one touchdown as a rookie, but he did have a thousand yard receiving season as a rookie, then in 2022, that thousand yard tight end group streak ended where the tight ends combined for just 595 yards. But then things got back on track last year. Pitts and Jonu Smith combined 
to go over 1,100 yards, though Arthur Smith, again, apparently had problems utilizing his best players. That's why he was fired, and he is now with, I think it, it's the Pittsburgh Steelers, so help them, I guess, because uh, Arthur Smith is a dumpster fire of a coach. But as the Buccaneers continue to try and develop Kate Otten as their number one tight end in Tampa while also building off a late surge by Payne Durham being a contributor late in the season. Not a big contributor, but obviously much more involved late in the year than he was early in the season when a lot of times he was a game day inactive. They want to make him a pass catching threat as well. So Justin Peel's track record kind of speaks for itself in terms of coaching up tight ends into true offensive threats. Now, of course, a lot of this is going to be predicated on the style of offense that Liam Cohen wants to run and how often those tight ends will actually be utilized. But last year under Canales, the tight ends combined for just 515 yards. That includes 400 and I'm sorry, 505 yards. That includes 455 from Otten and then negative 10 receiving yards from David Wells. So when you take a look at Otten, Durham, and Keeft, it was 515 yards of offense from the tight end position. So that's a position group now that the Buccaneers want to make more viable for Baker Mayfield, but Otten can't do it by himself. Building up Durham is going to go a long way, but do not rule out the addition of another tight end to potentially replace Co'Keefe since he really isn't a pass-catching threat. And that's fine. They use him as a blocker, and he excels in that role. That's why they drafted him in the first place. But if Cohen's offense is going to utilize pass-catching tight ends, you want all of your tight ends to be able to fit that role, to be able to block, to be able to catch, to be able to be an outlet for Baker Mayfield. So after the draft, the Bucs may look to add a low-cost veteran tight end to bring in and actually be able to utilize them in the passing game. You do have some tight ends still floating out there. They're probably still going to be floating out there after the draft, but you have some older guys that were threats in the passing game in players like C.J. Uzama and Logan Thomas. Logan Thomas was a phenomenal pass-catching tight end in Washington and has been riddled with injuries over the last few years. I take a look at that as saying, look, here's Logan Thomas. We know he can catch the football. And if he's not even the number two tight end option, and this is a guy we can sprinkle in in multi-tight end sets and be able to utilize him as a pass-catching third tight end, that body's probably going to hold up a little bit better just because he won't have a significant amount of snaps that he's taking. But beyond that, you look to guys that have some familiarity now with Liam Cohen or Justin Peel. You have former Falcon, uh, Miko Pruitt, who played for Peel in Atlanta the last couple of years. You have former Los Angeles Ram, Bryson Hopkins, who I've talked about on this show a couple of times. But to me, this is a big sign that they want to improve a group of guys that have some raw talent and Kate Otten took a big step last year, but get this group up to a level where they can take some of the pressure off of Mike Evans and Chris Godwin and then provide that reliable safety net to Baker Mayfield on those second downs, on those third and shorts, to be those stick movers, those chain movers, and continue to extend drives. Then we saw Kate Otten as kind of a minor red zone threat last year, but he did come away with some really important touchdown catches. Payne Durham had a huge catch in the divisional round loss to the Detroit Lions. So you want to see these guys built up and be a bigger part of the offense moving forward under offensive coordinator Liam Cohen. I want to jump into the chat really fast. Uh, we got San Anto Gato, Scotty J, Joe Parnin. Uh, we got Ward Burns all in the chat. Uh, San Anto Gatto says, I say Godwin is due for a great year. Let's hope so. Going to talk about him in just a second. 
uh scotty j says for decades we have never gotten respect tv 12 was the reason we won according to the press i like them overlooking us year after year we're going to talk about that more in just a little bit because coming up next chris godwin is he about to go off next season that is coming up next on today's episode of locked on bucks part of the locked on podcast network your team every day Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines, over-unders, anything you can think of. You can even pick who's going to win it all. The favorite to win it all and go back-to-back is UConn at plus 370, while Houston is plus 550, Purdue is plus 700, Arizona is plus 1,200, and Auburn rounds out the top five at plus 1,500. Meanwhile, my beloved Illini is sitting at plus 3,500 odds to cut down the nets. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down those nets. Thank you again for making Locked On Bucks your first listener view every single day. Every day, make sure you are coming back tomorrow. We will be going live on YouTube yet again probably right in the same time frame between 1.30 and 2 o'clock, somewhere in there. So make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel. You have those notifications turned on so you know when I go live. But are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day and you have to turn down the volume with all that shouting going on all the time? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked on Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So Chris Godwin may be in line for a massive season next year thanks to Liam Cohen and his vision of what the Buccaneers offense can be. Greg Amon of Fox Sports and longtime Bucks beat writer was on Sirius XM's Fantasy Sports Radio and was asked about Godwin's role in the Bucks offense this coming season. And Greg said, quote, what's huge for Chris Godwin is Liam Cohen coming in. They had tried to move him outside and ease up on some of the hits that you take going across the middle as a slot receiver in the NFL. And I think they've made the decision that they want him back in the slot. And Liam sees him being in the same role that Cooper Cup was in Los Angeles when he was there. With Cooper Cup, you think about an NFL triple crown winner in that exact position in this offense. That bodes really well for Godwin. He's a guy who might not catch Mike Evans in terms of touchdowns, but in terms of targets, catches, and yards, he could put up huge numbers if that's the role he is in. This is a contract year for him. If he's going to get the same kind of money he got in his last deal, he's got to step up and be more productive, more consistent part of the offense. End quote. Taking a look at Godwin over the last few years, he had more targets than Evans in both 2021 and 2022. And if you remember, he only played in 14 games in 2021 because of that ACL injury that he suffered right before the playoffs. I still maintain if Godwin doesn't go down, the Bucks beat the Rams. They go on, they win the Super Bowl back-to-back seasons, but I digress. Uh, he got 127 targets to Evans' 114 in 2021. Then in 2022, he got 142 targets to Evans' 127. And then last year, even with the slow start that Godwin had, he finished with just six fewer targets than Evans on the season. And Godwin has more receptions than Evans in four out of the last five seasons. 
he just doesn't rack up as many yards or as many touchdowns in general as Evans does. But Godwin has been the money down guy, the third down guy that has been trusted to bring in those tough catches over the middle to extend drives and move the chains. Then, of course, the scoring opportunities for Godwin have been affected by Evans. And then you go back to Tom Brady's tenure. His scoring opportunities were affected by Rob Gronkowski being here and Antonio Brown when he was in Tampa. Then you had Leonard Fournette, who was a pass catching threat out of the backfield and got a lot of those red zone touches. Scotty Miller was the deep threat there for a couple of years with Tom Brady. So Godwin's chances to get in the end zone have been limited. He had a career-high nine touchdown receptions in 2019 in Jameis's 30-for-30 season. Since then, he's had touchdown receptions of seven, five, three, and then two last year. If Cohen, if Cohen does indeed use Godwin the way that the Rams used Cup, those numbers are going to skyrocket. Which brings me to a point that I've made on this show a couple of times so far this offseason. We keep talking about freeing up cap space for the Bucs by extending Tristan Wirfs, extending Antoine Winfield Jr., restructuring Vita Vea, and then I have continuously brought up you know, working on an extension with Godwin, who's in a contract year. Now, maybe Godwin doesn't want to do a deal right now because he is coming off of somewhat uh, a somewhat disappointing season. And even though he finished with 83 receptions and 1,024 yards, that's his third straight 1,000-yard season and his fourth in five years. But it would be smart for Jason Light to try and extend him you know, uh, for a year or two to not just provide some relief on that $27 million cap hit, but get ahead of a potential career season for Godwin. And again, maybe Godwin's holding out and he says, you know what? I know what I can do in Liam Cohen's offense. I saw what Cooper Cup did in this offense. I'm about to make some serious bank. But let's not even say that Godwin puts up 2021 Cooper Cup numbers because those were absolutely insane. 145 receptions, 1,947 yards, 16 touchdowns. Let's take a look at 2019 Cooper Cup when Liam Cohen was the receivers coach. Cup had 94 receptions, 1,161 yards, and 10 touchdowns. That would be the second most receptions, second most yards, and the most touchdowns that Chris Godwin has had in a season over the course of his career. In 2022, when Cohen was the offensive coordinator in Los Angeles, Cup only played in nine games. He finished with 75 receptions, 812 yards, and six touchdowns. So if you extrapolate those numbers over the course of a full season, that's 141 receptions. That's 1,533 yards, and that is 11 touchdowns. All of those would be career highs for Chris Godwin in a season. All of that is to say this, Mike Evans is going to get his. Cade Otten is looking to take on a larger role than he had last year, which was a larger role than he had in his rookie year. And the Bucs bringing in Justin Peel as the tight ends coach looks to try to develop and increase Cade Otten and Payne Durham's role. So his numbers are probably going to go up as well. But Cohen has big plans for Chris Godwin and extending him now could be the difference between Godwin being a Buccaneer next season or being the top paid free agent wide receiver when the market opens in 2025. I'm going to jump over to the chat again real quick. Uh, Noah 2023 says the success of the wide receivers will depend on Baker, the running backs, and the offensive line protection. Baker has a lot to prove, and I hope he does on an elite level. You know, you're you're absolutely right. Baker is going to play into the production of the wide receivers without a doubt. They do need somebody else to come in and compliment Rashad White and try to get that running game out of the basement of the NFL. Then you have a glaring hole at the guard position where the Bucs need to find a mauler to come in and line up in between Robert Hainsey and Tristan Wirfs to help 
keep Baker from having to make these Houdini escapes out of pressures and sacks and try to make plays down the field while also opening up better running lanes for Rashad White, Chase Edmonds, and whatever other running back the Buccaneers happen to bring in. At the same time, we could work a little bit on the vision and the uh, decisiveness of Rashad White to hit those holes quicker and try to you know gain some positive yardage instead of dancing around in the backfield and turning a four-yard gain into a one-yard gain. So, Bucks versus Falcons for the crown of the NFC South. That kind of talk is already reaching peak levels. That is coming up next on today's episode of Locked on Bucks. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. It can be easy to ignore our social battery and spread ourselves thin, especially with social gatherings picking up after the winter. I know for me, between my day job, the podcast, and traveling every weekend due to my son's schedule, I find myself drained faster and faster every day, but still having to push through in all situations, telling myself it's for the greater good, regardless of how I feel in the moment, often ignoring my own needs in service of others. Speaking to someone on the outside without a personal bias in my day-to-day -day life can be extremely beneficial and help me reshuffle what I view as a priority versus what should actually be a priority. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a license, licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your social sweet spot with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on today and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on. Wrapping things up here on a live Thursday edition of the Locked On Bucks podcast. And I was going to say this to the end, but I, I feel like I want to get you guys in the chat involved. All of you joining in on the live, I love you all. You guys are awesome. We have March Madness happening right this minute, and you're spending your time with me. And for that, I appreciate each and every one of you. But we are conducting our Locked On Network mock draft tonight, Thursday night. And of course, I will be making the pick for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I've already been working the phones to try to see what kind of deals can be made, but I want to know what you guys think and, and who you believe I should target with the Bucs first round pick, if I should trade up, if I should trade down, if I should go best player available at 26. Let me know your thoughts in the chat, and I will circle back and jump in and talk about that at the end here, but I have to talk about this because to me, it's, we are in the middle of March and this has already reached peak shaking of my head, but on speak on, on FS one, they asked the question, who do you trust more to win the NFC South, the Buccaneers or the Falcons? The Falcons are apparently the new hotness because of Kirk Cousins, and then you have Raheem Morris coming in, getting his second opportunity as an NFL head coach. And LaShawn McCoy, a Super Bowl champion with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, said it's a coin flip, which former Buccaneers staff writer and current Fox Sports reporter Carmen Vitale took exception with. But here's the thing. We are too far out from the start of the season to be crowning the Atlanta Falcons with anything. Yes, everyone is all excited that Kirk Cousins is coming to town, but is he really going to make that big of a difference? He's been the quarterback for three winning seasons since leaving Washington. And one of those seasons, the Vikings went eight, seven, and one. Kirk Cousins has played in four playoff games. He has been one and done twice. They beat the Saints in the wild card round in 2019 and then lost to the 49ers in the divisional round. In 2022, they lost to the New York Giants. 
the Daniel Jones New York Giants. With Washington in 2015, they got absolutely boat raced by the Green Bay Packers. That's the guy that all of a sudden is going to elevate the Falcons to no doubt NFC South champion status. Come on. Come on. And I'm not saying Atlanta isn't a talented football team. They have a lot of talent on that team. Kyle Pitts, B. John Robinson, Drake London, Grady Jarrett, Jesse Bates, David Anyamata. They're like, they have a lot of talent on that roster. But just because Kirk Cousins, coming off of a ruptured Achilles, signed a four-year, $180 million deal at age 35, and all of a sudden, they're getting crowned. Last time I checked, there is only one quarterback in the NFC South that has more than one playoff win, and he has playoff wins with multiple teams. The last time I checked, there is only one team in the NFL that has a wide receiver duo with the most receiving yards of any duo in the league, and they reside in the NFC South. Last time I checked, only one team in the NFC has made the playoffs for four straight seasons, and they also reside in the NFC South. All of those are the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So how about everyone just take, take a deep breath and wait a little while before handing out accolades for offseason champions and crowning teams as division champs before the draft? I just saw a power ranking the other day on Twitter, where they have the Chicago Bears fifth. They don't even have a quarterback yet. And all of a sudden, they're the fifth best team in the NFC? Come on. Come on. Everybody, just take a step back. The NFL draft hasn't happened. All of these teams in the NFC South are going to add more talent and more players and fill more roster holes. So on March 20th or 21st or whatever today is, let's not talk about how the Atlanta Falcons are the team to beat in the NFC South. The road to the playoffs still goes through Tampa, and it's going to stay that way until someone bumps them from the top. That's just my feelings on it. I had to get that off my chest because this, this Kirk Cousins stuff is a little... It's a little much. So circling back, I promised I would. We have the Locked On NFL Network mock draft tonight. And I said, who do you guys think I should target? Should I stay at 26? Should I trade up? Should I trade down? What do you guys think? Noah 2023 says, need a premier edge rusher. Then Joe Parnon in the chat says, number one, Jared Verse, number two, Latu, number three, McKinstry, number four, Trice. These are my top four for the first round. Trice is looked over in my opinion. We have David in the chat says, get a lineman with the first pick, either offensive lineman or edge. If someone wants to trade up and gives us a late first and a couple of other picks, take it. We need help everywhere. Um, let's see. We have anybody else in here talking about the, oh, Realtor David says Latu staying at the 26th pick. So he doesn't want me to make a trade there. Uh, Christopher Apple in the chat says Bo Hurst. That's not a name that I've heard associated with the Bucks very often. Uh, in regards to my Kirk Cousins rant, uh, San Anto Gato says, that's right, James, it goes through Tampa. And then uh, we have Ruben in the chat. Uh, he says, finally caught one of these live. Been listening for a while, but I'm never free when you go live. Kirk to the Falcons is the same storyline as Derek Carr to the Saints to me. My reaction, meh, with the shrug emoji. Yeah. And I, I saw somebody else mention it in the chat. I I've gone far past it. They said the same thing was happening with the saints last year after they signed Derek Carr. And, and that's a hundred percent correct. As soon as the saints got Derek Carr, all of a sudden it was the saints division to lose. 
Baker Mayfield's going to be a bum. He's on his, you know, fourth team in two years or whatever it was. And sure enough, it was still Tampa that was on top when all was said and done. Uh, back to the draft, San Anto Gato says Powers Johnson, the center out of Oregon. I think he's going to be gone by time the 26th pick rolls around. Uh, Corey Blankenship in the chat says Chop Robinson. You guys know I love me some Chop Robinson. Uh, I am a, a big fan of his. And then uh, Realtor David says, James, any reason not to pursue Stefan Gilmore in free agency? Uh, a couple of reasons. I'm guessing Gilmore is probably looking for a little bit more money than the Bucks are willing to spend. And at this point, the Bucks have really addressed a lot of depth at corner. I think if they're going to bring in another corner, it's going to be through the draft, whether that's on day one, depending on how the board falls, or potentially day two, where they may look to bring in a guy who is, you know, off the charts, charts athletically, but you may not plug and play him as a starter immediately. We know how difficult of a system Todd Bowles runs and his defensive scheme usually takes a little while. There's a very severe learning curve when it comes to playing, especially in the secondary in Todd Bowles defense. So you may see the Bucks go for a Rake Estrell or a Kool-Aid McKinstry in round one if those edge rushers are gone. And they may not start ahead of Zion McCullough or Jamel Dean when the season starts, but then they can bring the guys along, start to rotate them in as they become more comfortable with the system. By year two, you're looking at a potential starter or maybe even late into year one, you're looking at a potential starter. And then we can get into the conversation the same way we did with Carlton Davis this year about Jamel Dean, what he is bringing to the team, his availability, depending on how this season goes and being able to get out from under that big contract that the Bucks gave him last year. So I would say Gilmore's probably, you know, right now, just because they seem pretty set in what they're doing in terms of starters and depth. I wouldn't rule out a draft pick, but I don't think we're going to see any more corners get signed in free agency. And then the last one real quick, we got Christopher Apple in uh, in the chat saying Graham Barton uh, for the first round pick. Uh, I'll, I'll throw this one into uh, Tones Max says Braswell from Bama. Uh, we will, um, we'll see how this all shakes out. Like I said, I've worked the phones already, maybe have a couple of tentative deals in place, depending on how the board falls. If I need to move up, or if I need to move down, depending on how all of this shakes out. But I'm not going to spoil it. You guys will have to wait to hear what I do with the Bucks' first-round pick when the full mock draft goes live on every channel. It's going to be a lot of fun to do. I, it's one of my favorite events that the network does. So until then, please check out everything going on over at BucksNation.com. Follow on Twitter, at LockedOnBucks, at JayArco underscore Bucks. I will be going live again tomorrow on Friday, probably between 1.30 and 2 o'clock like I did today. Make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel and you have those notifications turned on so you know as soon as I go live. Hope you all have an absolutely outstanding day. Stay safe, stay healthy, fire the cannons. I want to thank you so much for joining me right here on Locked On Bucks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We'll